Good day, everyone, and welcome to today's Living Life. Uh, welcome to chapter 11 of Romans. And um, I'm sure you, you may have heard of the idiom, one man's trash is another man's treasure. Now, I bring that up because we're talking about Israel and um, how Israel have rejected Jesus and then the Gentiles have accepted um, you know, Jesus in their place. And it kind of sounds almost like a political discussion on um, what is it? How you know the people of Israel is, are going to end up as a nation and within the kingdom of God? What is their place? What is their role in salvation, <clears throat> and so forth? So it almost there's an impression that is there a suggestion that Israel has missed their opportunity to be saved? You know when they were the very first to meet and encounter Jesus Christ. You know, I'm sure you have heard these kind of discussions or arguments and, uh, you know, other people of Israel doomed. What's going to happen? Is Jesus going to save them in a special event at the end of days? And, you know, these are some of the things that you wonder about and may have read or even heard about as well. But today, rather than getting into that, you know, politi- you know, theo-political discussions and issues, we're going to be talking about salvation and what it means on the whole and as an overarching theme. So let's read the passage and then we'll continue. Romans chapter 11, verses 1 through 12. I ask then, Did God reject his people? By no means. I am an Israelite myself, a descendant of Abraham from the tribe of Benjamin. God did not reject his people whom he foreknew. Don't you know what the scripture says in the passage about Elijah, how he appealed to God against Israel? Lord, they have killed your prophets and torn down your altars. I am the only one left and they're trying to kill me. And what was God's answer to him? I have reserved for myself 7,000 who have not bowed the knee to Baal. So too, at the present time, there is a remnant chosen by grace. And if by grace, then it is no longer by works. If it were, grace would no longer be grace. What then? What Israel sought so earnestly it did not obtain, but the elect did. The others were hardened. As it is written, God gave them a spirit of stupor, eyes so that they could not see, and ears so that they could not hear to this very day. And David says, May their table become a snare and a trap, a stumbling block and a retribution for them. May their eyes be darkened so they cannot see, and their backs be bent forever. Again I ask, did they stumble so as to fall beyond recovery? Not at all. Rather, because of their transgression, salvation has come to the Gentiles to make Israel envious. But if their transgression means riches for the world, and their loss means riches for the Gentiles, how much greater riches will their fullness bring? Now, if you look at verse 1 and then 11 of today's passage, Paul, uh, you see a characteristic of Paul's writing. That is, he writes very technically and he writes kind of confusingly. And what we see is that there are two negative, two negatives. So, I mean, let me read it for you. Verse 1 says, Did God reject his people? Right? One negative. Did God reject his people? But then he follows a negative with another, reg- another negative, by no means. And in verse 11 as well, as verse 11 as well, it says, Did they stumble um, so far as to fall beyond recovery? Not at all. Right? A negative to negative. And then sometimes we want to focus on the negatives when we read you know, anything, but also especially when we come to the Bible. We want to look at the rejection in the wording in, uh, in what we read. But the important thing is the situation um, is not who God rejected, right? Because remember, Paul is negating the negative. He's rejecting the negative. Uh, where, but then we sometimes get too caught up on, oh, 
God is rejecting some people. Who has God rejected? God is rejecting this, these people and accepting these people. That's not the point. The situation, actually, if you think about it, is that we should all be rejected, right? That is the default situation. But God doesn't, and He chooses to accept us, and not just some of us, but all of us, and that is the salvation that we have. Even if an entire people reject Him, God will do whatever it takes and whatever He needs to do to make sure that we are not all doomed and completely separated from Him. And this is the grace that Paul talks about in verses 4 to 6. Now, this is the result of the covenant, yeah? uh, the covenant that God Himself made with us. And the covenant doesn't say anything about rejection. Right? Covenant is about drawing people to Him drawing those people who are not with him into him. It is about adoption, it is acceptance, God choosing us, and all because of grace, as um, Paul talks about in verses 4 to 6. Now, the context is important. The context of chapter 11 in the scheme of things in the book of Romans, chapter before um, and, and after. And the question, like, is the question uh, one of Israel's salvation and their place in their own salvation, and also the salvation of the, you know, of the world, the Gentiles, and the rest of us, and the rest of humanity for the rest of history. Is that the question? And in my research, um, what I found out, and what I, what I really agree with, is that that is not the context. It's not about their place right, in salvation. But, uh, I mean, it's part of it, but the real context, the real point uh, in chapter 11 in talking about Israel and salvation is actually addressing the spiritual pride of the Gentiles as opposed to the Jews. Now, I mean, you can kind of imagine the situation uh, that I kind of explained a little bit in the beginning uh, of the introduction, um, that Christ came to the Jews, right, the Israelites, but then they didn't really readily accept him, except for the disciples, you know, a couple of thousand as it may be. But then once the gospel goes beyond the borders of Israel, it is being accepted left and right. Huge throngs of people are coming to Christ. And so in a sense, the Gentiles are starting to get a little bit proud, you know, prideful, proud, before they couldn't become a Jew, right? The most, that there was only, there was a limit how much they could uh, become in terms of knowing God, right? So they were, there was a bit of a rejection in that sense. But now, through this man, God, Christ, they can be with God, right? And it bypasses the laws of all laws of the Jews and all their traditions and so forth. So I think there was a situation where the Gentiles were getting a little proud, like, hey, look at us, we are now the special ones, not you. So it, against that background, uh, we have, you know, even the, the theology of election, as in some are chosen to be with God and some are rejected by God even. But you have to remember that Paul, in his writing, in his theology, in all his letters, he loves the body of Christ. That is a huge concern for him, and he is concerned with the health um, of the body of Christ. So the message here, and I want to quote uh, one of the commentators that I researched, he says, God chooses those who are truly His. His choice is not based on anything we have done or could do. It is not determined by the nation we live in, the family we are born to, or the church that we attend. Yeah? So for us, election is dependent on our genuine faith in Christ. And the commentator continues to say, election is no larger or smaller than the extent of genuine faith in Christ our faith, which is our response to Christ. And this is the beginning of our, uh, of our salvation, the foundation of our salvation, your salvation, my salvation. And salvation is going to be the overarching theme in chapter 11. And today, the beginning of chapter 11, I want us to think about what it says in Philippians 2, uh, verses 12 to 13, where it says, Work out your salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who works in you both to will and to work for His good pleasure. So today as we begin 
uh, chapter 11, and we're going to be talking about chapter 11 for three days, for the next uh, two more days. And I want you to think about your salvation. Maybe even think about your salvation testimony. If you don't have one, I think this is a great time for you to write one. Everyone should have a written salvation of testimony. It's almost like a spiritual resume. And I want you to, uh, you know, I, I don't quote Philippians 2 lightly, but work out. Write down, write out your salvation and think upon it, meditate upon it. And we're going to unpack this for the next couple of days. But we, you need to be grounded up by, uh, on how you are saved, how you came to Christ and gain confidence and even worship out of that experience and that testimony as well. So that is my uh, encouragement for you today. Let's pray. God, we thank you uh, that you have saved us and that it is you who have saved us. You who came, you who did all the work, you who paid the ultimate price, the sacrifice, so that we can be saved, Lord. We thank you that you accept us, that you choose, and you chose to receive and accept us, and to have us be your sons, be your daughters, Lord. What grace, uh, what wonderful grace and love uh, that we have uh, that is all encapsulated within our salvation. So we thank you that you have saved us. I thank you that you have saved me, Lord. And we pray um, that as we think upon uh, our salvation in you, may we grow as worshipers and as your sons and daughters, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.